we all certainly appreciate your candor on all of that, Dr. Campbell. Thank you. And up next, we have Rita. Rita, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, hello, Dr. Collins. A great presentation. We met at the Real Truth About Health conference in Long Island, New York, a couple of years ago. Could you tell me something about the immunology lab in Portugal, if you are aware of it? Uh, one of the epidemiologists had invited one of my registered dietitian nutritionist friend to set up a nutrition clinic for cancer patients there. And they had, they had met in Sweden at the conference and I do not have any other detail on that. So would appreciate if you know of any information. There's information on who are the people involved? Um, he was he was in he was in charge of this either he was an epidemiologist or immunologist in charge of the lab and he wanted my expert RDN friend to go and set up a nutrition uh, clinic because they were weak in nutrition over there in Portugal. So I want to know if you are aware of this uh, clinic in Portugal, which is not. It is very quiet. People are not talking about it, but wanted to know if you know of them since you are all over. Well, yeah, I spoke in Portugal, by the way. Uh, that was a, a really big crowd. Uh, and uh, it was organized out of the Minister of Health's office. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, and uh, that was in Lisbon. And, uh, and then uh, the person who organized that, uh, his name escapes me, I'm embarrassed, but uh, he was the one who was in charge of uh, the macrobiotic diet program in Portugal, which is similar to what I talk about. Um, and uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful person, he and his wife. And uh, I'd give you his name, but unfortunately, about a year after I was there, this four or five years ago now, uh, he went deep sea diving and never came back. Uh, so he lost his life. But uh, in Portugal itself, I do not know of any particular clinic you're talking about, except if you go to the, look up something about macrobiotic, uh, an organization that has had a laboratory and so forth in uh, Lisbon. Uh, that might get you, uh, get you some ideas. I'm sorry, that's all I know. Thanks, Dr. Campbell. Up next, we have Amanda. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Uh, Campbell. I had a quick question. Um, at the beginning of your lecture, you you mentioned that something about being surprised, like we, we're not further than we should be knowing what we know now. <laughs> um, here recently, there was a company called Perfect Day that has released an animal-free dairy that is fermented, but it still contains, I can't remember if it's casein or whey, um, but it doesn't come from an animal. It's like I said, fermented and a, like a vat. And um, I, I don't eat it, um, but I know um, being a vegan and in a lot of vegan groups, of course, they're very excited about it because it's supposed to have the same taste and texture, but I don't think people are really thinking about the um, health benefits of it or not necessarily benefits, but not benefits. <laughs> but um, do with it not being an animal, I guess my question is with it not being an animal protein, like an animal from an animal, but it's still casing our way protein, it would still have the same effects as your research shows. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, actually, that's a, that's a really important question you're asking because there is a lot of interest in that. There's two kinds of uh, non uh, animal sort of plant based diets, as you say. Uh, one kind is a, where they just use uh, plants themselves with the protein and so forth, and they make up products uh, that they use soy, as you probably know a lot, they use other legumes as well. Um, and so that's one kind of uh, uh, plant-based food product, you know, loaded with protein. Uh, that's uh, sort of okay. It's a step in maybe in the right direction, but they also tend to use uh, too much salt uh, and uh, fat. Uh, which is problematic. So I, I'm, not, I'm not terribly fond of that. But even though I know I acknowledge the fact that uh, maybe it's for a lot of people a step in the right direction. I think your question, though, however, is related to a different kind of uh, non-animal protein uh, product. 
um, and they they argue, and rightfully so, that uh, they they the protein they get for that uh, has the same sort of amino acid composition as normal animal proteins. Um, and so they say, this is just like animal protein. It tastes just like it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're, they're quite right. They do get, uh, uh, if they use a cell from a pig, for example, a cell, a cell dish, a feature plate or whatever, and they ramp it up and, and create a, a production of proteins from that one cell and then enter billions of cells. If they produce the protein from that pig cell, they're going to get pig protein, very, you know, essentially the same thing. If they take a cow protein, in general, he's just saying that sort of thing, we, we get different kinds of animal proteins, but just depending on the cells they use. However, I have a real serious problem with that because as you, I think, suggested, that is, that's not solving the problem. And in no way is that solving the problem. Yes, it may cut down on having to kill animals uh, to, to the extent that we do now. On the one hand, although these cells still come from animals, the problem is when they take those cells and ramp it up in production, they're going to be using stuff in there that, two things, they're going to be using stuff in there, maybe antibiotics, other stuff that bring into question the, the, the safety of those products. But more to the point, the proteins being produced has an amino acid composition like other animal proteins. That is what causes the problem in the first place. So they've achieved nothing. So what I'm basically saying, that kind of product that is claiming to have the taste, feel, texture, composition, whatever you want to say, of animal protein, uh, that's not what you want. You know, we, we just got to drop that idea that we need to find some kind of protein that mimics animal protein, because we don't need that. That's what, as they say, that's what causes the problem. Thanks, Dr. Campbell. Up next, we have Mark B. Hi, Mark. Hello, thank you. Hello, Dr. Campbell. Um, I always learn something new every time you present. Thank you so much. Uh, my wife and I took your eCornell course back in November, and my 19-year-old daughter actually took it in January, and she's in college now. Um, so we're huge believers in your works. Now, I've been normal for all metabolic markers for more than two years now after having metabolic syndrome of all categories except HDL for about 20 years. Um, I had to give up watching TV to get all of the advertising out of my head so that I could get away from processed foods. So we've done a lot of talking about animal products, but can you talk about the importance and what you would recommend for someone trying to get processed foods out of their life, whether they're vegan, vegetarian, or whatever? To, to get what out of their life? Get processed foods. Oh, processed foods. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, that word process, I don't, Particularly care for it because when we say process, <laughs> that means in some ways treating the food in a special way. Uh, and, and actually, you know, you can take it to the extreme and, and argue that uh, food is chopped up, it's processed because it's chopped up, it's a process. Uh, or you do other kinds of things like that. Uh, so I don't, and, and, and process also means to a lot of people the use of a lot of chemicals, uh, as you know. So I think in generally, that's what it generally means, but it can mean different things to different people. Um, and I would, that's why I like to use the word convenience foods instead of processed foods, because convenience foods, I'm just drawing on the fact that those kind of foods, candy, candies, cookies, pastries, et cetera, the other kind of foods you see in uh, gas stations, uh, shelves and stuff, they're really convenient. You grab them, run, and they're tasty. Those kind of products are loaded up with salt, sugar, and fat. And those three products, uh, basically are addictive. And that's exactly what the story is all about. The companies, they, they can only use, maybe they'll only use plant parts, take some fiber, take this and that, make a product, flour, of course, is, et cetera, uh, and, and sugar. They take what otherwise is good nutrients when they're present the whole food. They'll mix and match it together, make a product that is addictive. And that's exactly what the company wants because then you want more. You know, when you become addicted to it, you can't give it up. You want more and more. Uh, so I think those kind of foods, whatever name we yet apply to it, uh, and I, as I say, I like to call them convenience foods. Some will call it processed. Some will call it what they are, you know, pastries and so forth and so on, soft drinks, um, high sugar foods. Um, that, how do you get it out of your life? <laughs> Especially out of children's lives. 
uh, because the advertising is quite intensive, as you know, and you get in schools. And uh, the, there's a program in New York City I've been associated with called the Schools for Healthy or Healthy Schools for Lunch, I think it is, and Nutrition. Uh, and so there's some uh, civic organizations around that are making attempts to uh, limit. Uh, that kind of exposure, that those kind of products for children's use, because it kind of traps them and gets them addicted. How do you get that stuff out of your life? I, I don't know. I, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm a, I liked sugar. So it found it a little more, a little more difficult to give up the sugar. Everybody likes a little salt, but you know, the more salt you get, the more you want kind of thing. You just have to kind of stick with it and eventually you get to the point where well, you don't need it as much. Pretty soon you say, oh, wow, this good whole plant-based food it tastes pretty good. Uh, as far as the television is concerned and hearing all that, I don't know whether you, what you meant by that, but you know, we have to put up with a lot of quite frankly crap on the TV, just watching all the advertisements that come out and they're always kind of, you know, shaping their stories and trying to just barely miss, you know, don't get in trouble with the regulations. And I don't know, it's, it's a tough, tough thing. Uh, then, and I, so I think, and I'm not much, I'm not a great fan of regulating everything. Uh, and that's why I tend to turn to ideas uh, educated. That's why this program, that, that's why uh, what, what Stephen and his friends have been doing is good. Uh, it's, it's, I think one of the best things you can do, that plus, uh, you know, teaching some, uh, giving some uh, teaching courses and cooking and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's just, a, it comes down to me for education because when, when I think about it in a broader context, and I spent about 20 intensive years in policy development in Washington and elsewhere, Beijing, London, and uh, I, I could see how the system works. Uh, the system works uh, in a way that favors uh, corporate interests. Let's face it, it's that simple. And uh, they, in turn, once they acquire quite a lot of funding, they uh, control the knowledge too. That's, that's the best way forward. So we end up being, our knowledge being controlled one way or another, maybe through the media, maybe through advertising, maybe through other ways, we, we end up being controlled without even wholly knowing it. And first thing you know, we're believing it. The best way to do is reach up and turn the knob off on the TV, I guess.